mankind and the elements. For some, it's an uncomfortable bond. A tropical rainforest is unforgiving. You can die in these kind of elements. For others, when weather strikes, inspiration begins. We can start to kind of bring together geometry and nature. These are the people who challenge nature, seek out its limits, reveal its secrets, and embrace its awesome power. In this episode, we'll meet an artist who transforms toxic sludge from the Ohio River into works of art. Nature has decided it would have a choice in what would show up. A scientist working to save the Joshua tree from warming climates. I'm really quite shocked, honestly, to see how many small trees there are. And a passionate boar hunter, preserving tradition in the wettest place on Earth. Wild boar hunting is it's not a trophy sport in our family. It's a way to put food on the table. These pioneers of the great outdoors ahead on That's Amazing. When you highline often, you really learn to train your fear like a muscle. Sometimes the height isn't the scariest part. Sometimes it's the exposure, which is how much space you can perceive around you. My name is Faith Dickey, and I'm a professional slackliner. So slacklining is the umbrella term for all the different facets of walking on a flat, woven band. One of these facets is highlining, which is walking a slackline high off the ground. One of the best ways to train for highlining is setting up slacklines over water. When the current is passing underneath you, you automatically start to fall that same direction, and it's almost like you're not in control of your body. And that's great practice for highlining, because in highlining, when you're dealing with all the fear and adrenaline, oftentimes it feels like you're not in control of your own body either. <laughs> Chamonix is a town in the Alps of France. And it's one of the places that really drives me in highlining. Being that high off the ground, you look at the valley below and the houses are just tiny specks. They look like toys. It's unbelievable. One of the high lines that I walked recently in Chamonix was on Aguil du Midi. And when we reached the top, it was a totally clear blue sky and we were surrounded by peaks. But during the process of rigging, the clouds started to roll in. It was like an acid trip walking the line. I was out there in space and exposure trying to balance and the line was swinging beneath me. Meanwhile, these huge white clouds were passing and the line would disappear, the anchor would disappear and then it would reappear. And there was no way to control it. I just had to hang on. The beauty of the mountains is awesome and yet it is a landscape that demands focus and respect. Alpine highlining is the purest form of the sport I can think of. In the shadow of Waialeale, Kauai, one of the wettest places on earth, a fourth generation boar hunter passes the proud tradition to his sons. When I get to take my sons out, it becomes much more than a boar hunt. It becomes an adventurous environmental experience. But new threats to endangered birds are disrupting the harmony of the fragile forests where hunters find their game. These are very, very endangered species, really susceptible to a new disease called avian malaria, and it's causing huge declines in our populations. These birds live in that specific niche because that's what they need. And when that gets changed because of a pig rooting where mosquitoes breed, you get a chain reaction of things that ultimately impact the bird's ability to thrive. So bird conservationists want to protect their habitats from boars and those who hunt them. Hunters are the only natural predators. And unless we can do our job, boars will continue to multiply and threaten our native birds. There's a clash playing out in paradise 
nobody's right or wrong. Frankly, we're not gonna make everybody happy all the time. Of all the U.S. states, Hawaii has more endangered plants and animals than any of them. And of all those in Hawaii, Kauai has the most. Waialeale is the mountain in the center of Kauai. It's the wettest spot in the world because it has 460 plus inches of rain a year. Waialeale means overflowing water in Hawaiian. Its round summit is exposed on all sides allowing for this unusual amount of rainfall. It's situated in a way as to receive the bulk of the rainfall that comes off the Pacific Ocean with the trade winds. We enjoy hunting in Waialeale, home of over eight different species of native birds. Scientists estimate that the first birds to inhabit Hawaii arrived eight million years ago. We think the wind is what brought the forest birds enough to actually start a whole new population and these birds exploded to fill all of these different niches and habitats. It's like kids going off to college, they became their own thing. They were here before man, and because of man, their environments have shrunk, and therefore their numbers have shrunk. Some native birds lost 90% of their species in just five years, and for some, less than 500 remain. The boar got here over a thousand years ago by the Polynesians. They brought it as a food source on the canoe to be sustainable. When you bring in feral animals into that environment, they explode. That much pressure from an animal has a huge impact on all of these birds that don't have a defense. Frankly, the only pressures they have are hunting. Wild boar hunting, is, it's not a trophy sport in our family. It's a way to put food on the table and help protect our forests. And I feel like I'm doing justice when I'm out there with the hunting dogs. I'm not only doing a spiritual thing, forefathers did a thousand years ago. I'm being a steward of the land. The wild boar enjoys to wallow onto that pond of mud, which becomes a mosquito bath. When the birds came to Hawaii, there were no mosquitoes and there were no avian diseases. The group of birds that's most prevalent here in Hawaii is really susceptible to a new disease called avian malaria, and it's causing huge declines in our populations. 99% of, of EEV die if they are bitten just once by an infected mosquito. They're that susceptible. These wild boars are gonna eventually run the island. Hunters are the only natural predators. Kauai's fragile forest could become a paradise lost. Hawaii is a unique place because of its people, because of the culture that lives here. We don't take care of our natural resources. It will be used up, and we don't want that to happen. These birds live in that specific niche because that's what they need. And when that gets changed because of a pig rooting where mosquitoes breed, you get a chain reaction of things that ultimately impact the bird's ability to thrive. 99% of, of EEV die if they're bitten just once by an infected mosquito. And if they go extinct here, they're extinct everywhere. We want to make sure that we're managing all the threats. Hunters are the only natural predators that boars have on the island. And unless we can do our job, boars will continue to multiply and threaten our native birds. Wild boar hunting is dangerous. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Although there's more to hunting than just putting your knife into a big old boar, it's a way of life passed down from many different generations. This is a trail knife given to me from my great uncle down to my dad and then to me. When I get to take my sons out, it becomes much more than a boar hunt. It becomes an adventurous environmental experience. It provides food for the table. It teaches them malama the aina, which means love the land you live on.
We enjoy hunting in Waiale Ale. It's not the best place to hunt, it's miserable. It's raining, it's cold. We had to travel to treacherous terrain before we even got to an area that was decent enough to hunt. Looks like some fresh pig digging on our trail. You can tell by these, uh, the lighter colored soil has not gotten the rain compared to the darker soil. You guys see it? You want to look at the diggings with the rain happening. You can actually track the animal. The dogs have a sense, a good sense of smell, and they're on the track of the boar. You want to listen to the boar's language, its roar, its scream. You want to listen for the bark of the dog. You can tell whether the dogs have the boar pinned or not. At that point, you have a fraction of a second to do your job, or that could mean the life of your hunting dog, your, your, your kid. You got to get in there as quick as possible and take care of business before business takes care of you. There is a big sense of pride when you harvest food from the land and put it on your table. It makes you feel like you can sustain life. A luau happens on a weekly basis with our immediate family and friends. It is our job to still practice what our forefathers have taught us. The Division of Forestry and Wildlife both have to protect animals and plants and the right to hunt. And we have to do both. If pigs are contributing to this mosquito life cycle, then one of our most important tools is conservation fencing. So that the areas inside the fences can be subject to pig removal and they will help us slowly but surely reduce those populations from within the fences and hopefully lessen the amount of habitat out there that's available for mosquitoes to breed in. All of these fences are constructed with little gates that hunters can go in and out of. I would like to see more smaller enclosures and have the boar still be able to roam and have their natural habitat. A lot of hunters, they want to be able to roam freely and not have to go all the way around a fence. The Polynesians had access to this island. All of a sudden now, we have only a sliver left. Those were areas that their forefathers went to, not only to harvest food, but to sing and dance and praise to the Akua. And now there's a gate or a stepping bridge that takes you over a fence. Can we work together to solve the problem, which is caring for the native birds? E ko mako makoa i loko kalani e hoano ia ko inoa e hiki mai ko apuni ameni. There is a lot to be learned from people who come from generations of knowledge. I would like to see our ways of life be part of the equation to solve these environmental issues, and that's why it it hurts when we work with these people who are textbook smart. We really try to work with hunters and use their expertise. The fact of the matter is, you can't save birds without fences. We're just trying to stop extinction. We're not succeeding. So we lose these birds, we lose the function of the forest, we lose our connection to history. It's, it's a battle that can't be lost, really, because it would just be such a, a huge tragedy. You want to take something back to the way it used to be, well, at what point is appropriate? Before or after humans came? Which humans? Very, very debated topic throughout conservation in the world. There's definitely a partnership. It's a balance and nobody's right or wrong. They need to be a bridge, a common element. And if I have to go out with just giving my son one memory, it'll be the memory of living a cultural lifestyle that was taught traditionally by his forefathers. That's my gift to my son. Let's share our mana'o, which Hawaiians say our knowledge from our mind and our heart. Teach.
just the textbook stuff. Let's work together to solve the problem. Conservationists continue to fight the extinction of Kauai's native birds with plans to erect more fencing. This vivid debate over conservation, culture, and history continues to play out in the wettest place on Earth. Across the Rust Belt, abandoned coal mines are leaching toxins into rivers and streams, turning them shades of dirty red. The color is disturbing, but for two men, it's also the tint of inspiration. One is a civil engineer with plans to extract these toxins from the waters. The other is a painter who transforms that material into acrylic paints and stunning works of art. This part of southeastern Ohio is considered Appalachia, and we have a strong relationship with the Ohio River. We have a strong relationship with all of the environmental destruction that's happened here. The abandoned mines have irretrievably altered the watershed, discharging acidic water into nearby streams and rivers due to a process known as acid mine drainage. So just in Ohio, there's more than 1,300 stream miles that are impacted by acid mine drainage. The mine that discharges here at this specific treatment site it's been abandoned for probably about 100 years. Fish and other aquatic life is really sensitive to pH, and the streams get coated with this iron sludge. This is the mine that we call the Batgate Mine Seep, and it has been pumping out acid mine drainage for the last 100 years now. The toxic discharge at Batgate is the result of an abandoned, improperly sealed coal mine. It delivers about 4,000 pounds of iron every day into this one stream nearby. That's like junking two cars into the stream every day. What I'm doing in my research right now is trying to come up with a way to clean up streams in Southeast Ohio. So through our research, we've discovered that when we remove iron from the acid mine drainage, we can precipitate it and settle it as a pigment. And I realized that by producing pigment, I could pay for this whole process. When I got to the dry pigment, I realized that I, I didn't have the skills to figure out what made a good pigment and what made a bad pigment. I basically was knocking on doors in the art department to see if I could find anyone to help me. And that's when I ran into John. I was like, could you tell me if this was a good paint or not? And we sat down and he said in very scientific jargon, well, the pigment needs to be this and it needs to be that. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. But what we really need to do is make something that visually is compelling. We need people to look at this and go, what? What are you doing? That's crazy. And get on board. One of the things that I really liked about getting the pigment from these acid mine seeps is that it has characteristics of the place where you get it from. So from Guy, I would come back and say, well, this is too orange, I want it to be a deeper red because it's more valuable for these reasons. Once I get the pigment from the lab, I put it onto a tempered glass table. I'll add an oil dispersant for there, which basically makes the pigment want to stick to things so it wants to become a good paint. And then that can be scraped up into jars or tubes and you can use oil paint for years and years and years and years. He makes these connections between nature and pollution and science. And he puts that in, in this something that is beautiful to see. We've had recent interest from Gamblin Artist Colors in Portland. And we are producing a custom batch of the color, 500 uh, tubes of oil paint with our name on it. The proceeds from selling the pigment will pay for the plant. It will pay for employees. It'll pay for the cleanup of a stream. The moment that the plant becomes viable, that is the moment that the stream goes back to biological viability. It's not a 10-year thing, it's not a 20-year thing, it's not a 50-year thing. It's a tomorrow kind of thing. Artists are not people who create from themselves, but they actually serve a role as communicators for the divine in the universe. I'm always thinking about these colors and how they relate to where it came from. Thanks to the team's efforts, in September of 2016, John was invited to exhibit his art at the United Nations in New York City. I'm very lucky to be invited to have a show at the United Nations headquarters. 
Then what I'm really hoping to do is to form even more collaborations with people in many places around the world where we're all working towards this goal of a more sustainable planet. In British Columbia, Galen Franklin spends much of his free time free diving with sea lions. And it's safe to say he loves it. Each winter, Franklin heads to nearby Hornby Island to play with the curious beasts who gather to feed on the herring that spawn in the cold waters 40 feet below. I kind of compare it with being at a giant dog park. Some of them love it. Like you start giving them armpit scratches and they're just like giant dogs. They just start rolling around and they're flying all around you. But these animals are huge. People are intimidated by them, but once you, once you learn their behavior, they're just right into you right away. They just look at you like a big chew toy. never see myself living anywhere other than the Pacific Northwest. I could literally spend every single day the rest of my life and never travel anywhere other than Vancouver Island and I would still never have enough time to see this whole place. My first introduction to the ocean would have definitely come from my mom. She's me with the sea lion right there. Later on in life, I realized that it is a pretty unique experience to get to go out and spend time with these animals on a regular basis. Sea lions are a large, intelligent animal and they're very sensitive of what your intentions are and and how they choose to interact with you is totally their choice but if you're comfortable and and they're inquisitive they'll come and they'll chew on your fins or they come up and they chew on the edge of your mask or give you big kisses on the lips or big hugs they wrap your, their fins around you and give you a big hug people get sketched out about it like I've had lots of people contact me and be like, don't you think those things are aggressive? Just because an animal's putting its mouth on you doesn't mean it's doing it in a harmful way. They don't have hands. They can't explore their world with anything other than their mouth. people that spend you know, a lot of money to travel to the other side of the planet to watch a group of large migratory animals in Africa or something say and here I can just go out on my boat and it's not something I take for granted at all anymore having the opportunity to do this. In the Netherlands, it rains a lot. Since I grew up, the weather is really changing. It rains more, it rains more heavy, and it's getting warmer as well. People uh, have a tendency to complain about the weather. I think it's beautiful when you hear the rain. It really changes space, and it also sustains growth. I wanted to make something to celebrate the weather. Made by Rain started after I got the heritage of my grandfather. This heritage was a, a collection of calendars where he wrote down every day the weather conditions. When I was doing my masters, I was thinking like, how can I actually map the weather? And then I started to doing the same as my grandfather, but then with textiles. I made this technique, pluviography, which is drawing with rain. There are two ways to make made by rain textiles. One I call analog version and the one the digital version. When I'm in The Hague uh, at my studio and it starts to rain, I go up on the roof. And for the analog version, I use uh, two layers of textile and of ink with paper. And when the rain hits the surface, the paper gets wet and it starts to bleed. So that makes that the white cloth becomes black or blue or depending on the color. The digital version, is prepared with a layer of ink already on the cloth. And when the rain hits the surface, the ink starts to bleed. Mm -hmm. 
after I put it in the rain, I fixate the textiles and then you can uh, wear it. With this technique, you can see every raindrop and every little detail in the rain. So after I fixate my textiles, I check the data from the weather station uh, in order to really finalize the moment and the, the, the data, which is silk screened upon the textile. Weather data comes in statistics, uh, and I wanted to make a more visual way of archiving weather. On the textiles, I note the location, the date, the time interval, the millimeters of rain and the weather uh, circumstances. And I do this because I see the textiles as documents. So they're all unique. Five minutes of drizzle is very different than five minutes of heavy rainfall. The book made by rain, it's in three parts uh, combined in one. One part is the research, one part is fabrics, and one part is an artistic interpretation of how the textiles can be applied. I'm very fascinated by water in all kinds of forms. The fact that water is able to transform between solid, gas and liquid brings for me a lot of new materials to investigate and to use in my work. I traveled all around the country already to map the rain. Uh, I've also been in Japan and in Beijing, so my dream is to make a rain atlas. I hope that with the textiles that I make, people get an, a new awareness of rain and a new relationship with the environment. I hope people see the beauty as well, not only the pouring rain and uh, waiting for it to be dry to continue your daily life. In the fertile hills of Derbyshire, England, one man is cultivating something unique. I'm Gavin Munro, I grow furniture. This is our furniture orchard. We've got chairs this side, lamps over here, tables a little further around that way, and uh, all manner of things in between. The original idea came from realising that the way that we make furniture now is that we have to grow the trees for at least 50 years and then we cut them down and we make them into smaller and smaller and smaller bits before sticking them back together again. Why bother with that at all? Why indeed? Gavin trains the branches of young trees by attaching them to specially made forms. He then grafts them together to form one solid piece. Slowly, they grow into fully formed pieces of furniture. But exactly how slow are we talking? For a chair to grow, that takes five to 10 years, depending on the species. The thing is, if you're thinking about this in the bigger picture, then by the time you've grown your tree for 50 years, we'll have at least 10 generations of chairs rolled out. While it seems slow, in real terms of making things out of wood, it's actually pretty quick. When we harvest the trees, we're not killing them. The varieties that we use all grow back again the next year. On the environmental front, it's not just efficient, it's uber efficient. Oh, we've only waited 10 years for that. <laughs> <laughs> we've got this lovely curve coming up here. When we sand this down, this little triangle is going to look gorgeous. You got it? Yep. We can get them into the workshop and the fun begins on the production side and we can start to kind of bring together geometry and nature. The finishing is where we can really let that shine. And no one can deny that Gavin's furniture is beautiful, but is it functional? Not only do we think that they'll be stronger, they'll be way stronger because they're one solid piece. There's no joints to come loose. What we're doing here is collaborating with the trees. It's kind of a beautiful way of working, really. The weather is really in your face in New Orleans. It is a character in the play of New Orleans. In the Ninth Ward, inventor and musician Quintron is fueled by a desire to hear things differently. 
That's why he built a device that turns weather into music. This instrument, the Weather Warlock, is a, an audio mirror of the sunrise and sunset. The Weather Warlock uses sensors to detect changes in light, precipitation, and wind, and transforms them into a haunting drone, which he streams to anyone wanting to rock out to Mother Nature. My name is Quintron. It's not my real name. It's a given musician's name. I definitely consider myself first and foremost to be a musician, but I'm also a builder and inventor of electronic musical instruments. And the device that we're talking about today is called the Weather Warlock, which is a weather-controlled analog synth. It's using the weather to create music. There's no microphones, there's no, it's not the sound of rain. That puttering sound is the sound of that sensor just starting to get enough light to sonically activate it. The Weather Warlock's outdoor sensors detect atmospheric changes. There is a temperature sensor, there is a set of our wind speed controlled sensors. There is a moisture sensor or rain or humidity or snow. And the last one would be the sky sensor, which is a sensor at the top and a little periscope that's aiming at the sky. Wires then carry all the collected data into the synth, which converts the information into sound. So you can play it like an instrument too. You can just let it do its thing, but I can also you know, change the timbre of the drone. Usually the most action is during sunrise and sunset. It's the closest thing to an audio soundtrack because it's moving at the same speed. It's literally an audio mirror of what you're looking at. So sunrise is officially over, according to the Weather Warlock and everyone else. Check one, two. Good evening. You are tuned into weatherforthablind.org, broadcasting as usual out of New Orleans, Louisiana. The Weather Warlock has become a live 24 7 online musical feed. The live stream is called Weather for the Blind, figuratively referring to the circadian rhythm disorder sometimes experienced by blind people who don't visually experience sunrise and sunset. Sunrise was at 5.15 this morning and sunset happening now, as you can hear, according to our UV sensors. Every moment of the day, there's something in, in flux in the weather. And to capture that in the audio is, became my intention. Our ears are always there. Those of us that are fortunate enough to be able to hear it's a powerful funnel to the soul and the brain. Deep in the desert of Utah, thousands of rock formations, known as hoodoos, stand guard over the barren landscape of Goblin Valley State Park. Hoodoos are mushroom-shaped sandstone, and Goblin Valley has the highest occurrence of them in the world. Typically found in dry, rocky areas, these unusual shapes are the result of wind and water breaking down the soft sandstone. Rainwater removes the weaker rock. Wind-blown sands and dust carve the stone into eerie goblin silhouettes. Other vegetation rarely inhabits Goblin Valley due to the lack of water and sweltering conditions. Goblin Valley has often been compared to Mars.
Scientists say the Joshua trees are disappearing. At low elevation and in the south, Joshua trees are not making it. Across the southwestern Mojave Desert. The only places where we find seedlings are up at higher elevation, like here. They're facing increasing and new threats to their existence. The combination of increasing temperature and drought alongside increasing frequency of fire. One lightning strike in a dry storm and the whole thing goes poof, and that's not good. Professor Chris Smith and his team are on a multi-year mission to map the genome of Joshua trees in the hopes of saving the species from total eradication. And the idea of losing that species affects people in a really personal way. By unlocking the plant's genetic code, they hope to reveal its best chance for survival in the face of rising temperatures in the West. According to legend, Mormon settlers saw in Joshua trees the image of the prophet Joshua pointing the way towards the promised land. Joshua trees are odd looking with their branches that stick up in all directions with spines sticking up toward the sky. They're technically a kind of yucca. Some people call them the Dr. Seuss plant. They are this important symbol of Mojave Desert, emblematic of the people that live in the desert. And the idea of losing that species affects people in a really personal way. There are many other organisms that depend on Joshua trees for food and habitat and shelter. And if Joshua trees go extinct, those other organisms are also doomed. If we could identify the exact genes that are involved in adaptation to climate change, potentially we could breed Joshua trees that could survive into the future, even as the climate changes around them. We've been able to bring together an enormous number of people who are cooperating. We have ecologists, we have genetic scientists, we have government agencies, and we even have citizen scientists all coming together to solve this problem. So we're gonna measure the width of the leaves. We measure from the midpoint, and you read it by looking at where the zero lines up, which is about 11.4 millimeters. When you think about all of the things that it requires for a Joshua tree to actually make it from a seed to an adult plant, the challenges that they face seem insurmountable. Each fruit contains 100 to 200 seeds. Maybe one of those might ultimately make it to grow up to be a Joshua tree. We're collecting leaf tissue, and that tissue we're gonna take back to the lab and extract DNA. And by comparing different parts of the desert, we can start to identify genes that are involved in adaptation to climate change. When we get the material from the field, we grind it up in liquid nitrogen and liberate the DNA from the rest of the cell material. After extracting the DNA, we're sequencing it in small bits and trying to stitch those pieces together, just like putting together a very complicated, massive puzzle. The genome really offers us a blueprint of the Joshua tree to better understand which genes might be allowing it to live under drier or hotter conditions. What we need to do is choose individuals that seem to be best able to deal with increasing uh, temperatures or reduced water availability. Those are the ones that we'll focus on trying to propagate in the face of this changing climate. This is the pure gold. This is how we're gonna connect back the patterns that we're seeing on the landscape to the genetic data and to the genome project. This is the most important part. We're right in the middle of what was a fairly large fire. I'm really quite shocked, honestly, to see how many small trees there are. We've got a lot of really good recovery in this old burned area. It's pretty exciting to see it. It really makes you feel good when you see something like this. You can see many young Joshua's, a foot and a half high, maybe smaller, uh, which is a sign that the populations are doing fine here. I can't imagine the desert without them. So uh, 
I hope they're doing as well as they look like they are. I definitely have days when I've been walking around for 12 hours, looking a ladder through the desert, and I wonder why the hell I'm doing this. What we saw today gives me hope. Joshua trees re-sprouting from rootstocks, and it makes me think, okay, it is possible that we could figure out ways that organisms could adapt to climate change. That's kind of it for me. Like that's, that, that's the dream of a lifetime.